Hello. Hello, everyone. Hi, Noah. Um, hey, Dio. Good to meet you in a virtual fashion. Um, we should introduce ourselves. I'm Dio Olapade. I am a political reporter at the Daily Beast and a fellow at the New America Foundation. And uh, I'm Noah Millman, and uh, I'm not employed anywhere. And uh, I blog at the American Scene, www.theamericanscene.com. Um, and I guess we have a lot on our plate uh, politically and culturally. Um, in many ways, the two overlap. Um, but I thought we should start by talking about uh, what's a sort of mini Super Tuesday um, of primary elections across the country. Um, That's which a preview, many people think, of what might happen to Democrats and Republicans come November. Um, obviously, you know, you have... Uh, major races of, of interest nationally um, in Pennsylvania for the Senate, in Arkansas mm-hmm. for the Senate. Um, and then you have sort of governor primaries and, and, and stuff like that. Um, but my, my basic impression is that uh, this is total chaos, that it doesn't really have a predictive function. The only thing that you could say with any type of accuracy is that if you're an incumbent, you're in trouble. Um, and that has very little to do with the relative merits of the candidates, although many of them um, have somewhat embarrassing records in Washington. Uh, but just the sense that people are pissed off and that throwing the bums out seems like the obvious solution. Yeah, um, you know, I'm not a political reporter. Um, and so, you know, and I'm not in a state where one of the high profile races is happening. I'm in New York. Um, so I may see this a little bit differently, but. It just, you know, what is being talked about, you know, you refer to it as sort of mini Super Tuesday or this is, you know, that it's utter chaos out there. Like, it, it just doesn't seem to me like the magnitude of what we're talking about, the number of races we're talking about or the number of seats that are predicted to change hands is that huge. You know, I mean, the 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 swing, I, I forget what the uh, most recent updating of it was, but you know, the, the, the likely swing of seats in the Senate in the fall um, is going to be something like, you know, well, I don't know, four to six to the Republicans or something. Maybe if it's a real wave election, they'll get as many as eight right. seats or something like that. Right. Um, that's not going to be enough for them to get control of the chamber. If they're very, very lucky and everything goes their way, they'll get control of the Senate. But that's not an extraordinary change in in, in the, you know, in the I, scale well, of... I mean, I think it is. I think it is. I mean, uh. I think the things that Barack Obama has been able to accomplish in his first year and change in office were almost entirely dependent upon having a supermajority for six months, which was almost entirely dependent on having Arlen Specter switch parties. Um, and obviously there are other th- factors. Um, but I think it matters because it's less about, again, the sort of the seats, you know, the people who are in the seats as so much as the count. And I think, you know, what I heard when I was uh, reporting a piece last week about Patrick Gaspard, he's the political director at the White House, was that they don't really care about, you know, this guy, Alan Mulholland, lost a primary in West Virginia last right. week. Um, but they were like, you know, like, he didn't do the work. Um, he wasn't prepared. And he got beaten by another Democrat that's probably going to win because it's a, it's, it's a long-time Repub- uh, Democratic seat. Right. So I think they're less worried about the individuals. And I I think, you know, they, Spectre was certainly helpful to them. I don't know what kind of promises were made back in April 09 when he switched, but you know, they've done, they've done okay by him. You know, Obama cut a campaign ad for him. He's not going to rally for him. He'll be in Ohio um, today, Monday. Um, But it doesn't matter because Joe Sestak will be a Democrat and is likely to win, is favored to win in November, even if he does. I think uh, think Sestak's actually in a better position. I mean, I I don't know whether he'll ultimately be favored to win. I think it's very early at this point even to say sort of what's likely in a state like Pennsylvania in November. But I I I would think think that Sestak is in actually a better position than Specter to win in November. And if I were, you know, if I were Obama or not Obama himself, but if I were, you know, his political operation, I'd be thinking, well, I probably want Sestak to win. You know, Specter is, you know, not going to be as strong a vote probably as um, Sestak is. And right. Specter is, you know, uh, not to put too fine a point on it, you know, relatively old. Um, and uh, there's a risk that he doesn't serve out a term. We don't know what, you know. Right. Yeah. I think he has no choice but to support him, Right. I mean, his 
decision Obama to switch. To uh, Obama Spectre. has no choice but to support Spectre in the primary, but that doesn't mean that he particularly cares whether he wins. No, right? he has he to pay him back. I wouldn't if I were him. And I just think, like, you know, for, for the Obama White House, it's going to be interesting in, on Tuesday to see where they stand based on how the candidates who are up for election stand with mm-hmm. voters. Um, there's, there's Spectre. There's also Blanche Lincoln, the poor thing, who I've been saying since last summer was going to be bounced. Um, Harry Reid is another good example. Right. But Lincoln is interesting because she voted for the Obama health care plan, you know, after a whole hell of a lot of arm twisting. And it's, it's sort of hurting her in Arkansas. Uh, but it's also hurting her with the left because she was so, um, I guess we could say moderate and sort of equivocal about the health care bill. Um, so right. the SEIU has been sort of slamming her with ads at the same time that voters in Arkansas associate her with the sort of Obama socialist brand. And I think it's difficult. I mean, you look at someone else like Archer Davis, who's running for governor in, Cal- in Alabama, who did not support the health care bill, um, should have. You know, he is, uh, again, trying to curry favors with voters in Alabama in a way that didn't help the administration, but might not help him either. So I think for the, the Obama administration to look at the outcome of, of Tuesday's races um, to see how they can be helpful to Democrats or right. in some cases to disappear. I mean, it's sort of like during the 08 campaign when, like, they were like, Al Sharpton, like, we know you support us, but please don't say anything, you know. Right. And so I think understanding where their brand is, is powerful and where it is going to do more harm might be one plausible outcome of Tuesday. And then it can allow them to calibrate their uh, behavior going through the summer and into the fall. Yeah, I mean, I think Arkansas is a tough state for Obama's Democratic Party. I mean, Obama's, the the face Obama has put on the Democratic Party is kind of the final triumph of the McGovern coalition, right? And that coalition is bigger than it was in McGovern's day, which is a big reason why Obama's the president and McGovern isn't. Um, And the sort of the, you know, the Appalachian belt, you know, belt of, uh, you know, stretching from Arkansas up to West Virginia, um, and actually into the center of, 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 of Pennsylvania is, uh, was tough territory for Obama in the Democratic primaries. It was, yeah. you know, the worst territory for him in the general election. Right. This is the part of the country that went more for McCain than it did for Bush, um, even as the whole country swung the other direction. Um, yeah, I, think I think it's, it's just tough territory for, right. for, for the Democratic Party as currently constituted. Okay, but also just to sort of be fair, I think it's tough for Republicans as well. I mean, I think that there are, you know, you saw Michael Bennett um, uh, bounced from his, you know, 30 years in, in Congress. Um, mm-hmm. Or sorry, no, he was only there for a couple of terms. But he was, you know, he was primary and he lost. Um, and I think Republicans are, it's not quite to the extent that I sort of imagined in my in my wildest dreams where you would have third-party conservative candidates um, who are largely unelectable from the general population, primarying, you know, just regular old right-wing Republicans Mm -hmm. in a way that advantaged Democrats the way you saw in the New York 23 race um, last fall. That hasn't quite happened, but I think Republicans also should be, you know, looking over their shoulders. um, And I think that that's something the White House understands. And again, this is just like a sort of uh, experiment. This, I think, this, this I think what's going on in the Republican Party is very different from what's going on in the Democratic Party. You know, okay. I, I think the, what, what, what you're seeing in part, I think, in the Republican Party is the sort of, uh, is a kind of displaced rage at the Bush years, you know, being, in, you know, inflicted now upon sort of the, what's left of the establishment in the Republican Party, as well as on, you know, on the Democratic Party. Um, the, you know, if I look at, and, there, and and there's no, I don't think there's a common theme between, say, what happened to Bennett in Utah and, let's say, you know, the election in Kentucky where Rand Paul may wind up being, you know, wind up being the nominee or what happened in that in that New York congressional race. I think, you know, the individual candidates are coming from very different places, but I think the, by any objective measure, the Bush years were an enormous disappointment to the people who made the Bush years possible. You know, Rove's strategy was all about energizing the base and, and, and getting it out. And I think, you know, that group of people is looking and saying, what do we get for it? Um, and is taking their vengeance. And I don't think the vengeance is particularly coherent. Um, you okay. know, I read, um, 
I read uh, Mark Lilla's piece about right. um, uh, the Tea Party you know, and Chuck Yeah, going I back well and rage and all of that. Um, in the New York Review of Books. Um, and uh, it was interesting. His, um, his whole thesis, right, that this is kind of, you know, angry individualist, sort of the libertarian impulse, you know, uh, venting its, uh, its, its, its anger, um, kind of tracks, uh, um, David Firm's book from a few years ago, uh, uh the 70s, okay. the decade that brought us modern oh, life. Okay. Um, so Firm's thesis being that, kind of what look like changes on the left and on the right, you know, both yeah. partake of a sort of libertarian impulse that we, you know, became more libertarian in our private lives, uh, our sex lives and, 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 uh, you know, attitude towards, uh, you know, drugs and things like that. And also more libertarian in our attitudes toward our financial lives and, and our responsibilities to our communities and so forth. And then all that sort of happened in the seventies. Lilith seems to be kind of tracking that. Um, and I have to admit, I, that's not really the way I think. That's not, I think, what's powering the sort of the Tea Party or sort of the general, you know, rage at the uh, Republican establishment. Um, I think there's, you know, a sense of, uh, of of real betrayal on the part of people who, you know, came to be true believers. You know, you had a political machine in the Republican Party that um, that used these people, um, that 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 organized themselves around getting these people out for their candidates um, and for their party, and it's just not clear what, if well, anything, isn't that a little bit was of an delivered. Consistency. I mean, I guess like the fundamental. I, I I enjoyed Lilla's piece. I thought it was very well done. Um, and again, just to summarize, it's about sort of like libertarian populism. It's about people about individual autonomy. Uh, sort of being the prevailing attitude in America, and uniquely American, I would also add, um, in a way that has sort of scrambled the political dynamics and created a very strong sentiment of mistrust in government, which I think Obama recognized um, in his State of the Union when he talked about the trust deficit that he and mm-hmm. Congress would have to grapple with. Uh, and I think, they, I think he understands that. Um, one quibble, though, and this is a sort of fundamental problem with having... Um, representative democracy at a time when people do not believe in government. It's a little bit like Thomas Frank's wrecking crew argument where it's like conservatives are not interested in government. Neither perhaps are the new libertarian populace of the country. Um, and yet it, it has to happen. Government exists. And so when you have people who just respect the institutions that they're meant to be steward stewards of, you have, I think under the Bush years, a strong contribution to this mistrust in government. Um, And it's maybe it was intentional, um, the sort of like maybe Rovian um, Jedi mind trick, you know, some elaborate plan. But also maybe they were just incredibly incompetent in a way that sort of contributed to. I don't don't really agree. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, you look at kind of where Bush came from within the Republican Party at the beginning of his um, of his of his career. Right, he positioned himself right as somebody who you know, tries to actually accomplish things. His record in Texas back then, I mean, it was a very relatively thin record. The Texas governorship is a relatively weak office, you know, but the way he spun it was not as, you know, I'm, you know, a 1994 Gingrich Limbaugh style, you know, government's the problem, you know, uh, campaigner. He ran as uh, someone who wanted to make government work. And the, the things that seemed to make him passionate were all about changing what government did as opposed to eliminating aspects of government. The education bill was something that he seemed to care an awful lot about personally, whether or not it made a difference and whether or not it was a good idea. No, I think that's right. Just talking about him as a person and and, and where he thought he was taking things. And and that's part of what I mean by the the, the rage that's there now is, is somewhat displaced. I don't... Think. No, okay, look, one thing yeah. to just be very clear about, like, okay, so we can talk about the Bush administration as incompetent and yeah. yet still contributing to the erosion of public trust. But what's more, I just think that there's um, a real, like, uh, sinister and disingenuous and active effort on the part of the Republican Party to misplace and displace blame if we're using that word, for what Mm -hmm. happened under the Bush administration. And you could look at the bailouts as a sort of quintessential example. Yeah. Um, And I I refer to, like, TARP 1 and 2, uh, which was, you know, supported 
by a bipartisan majority in the Senate and the House, um, was happened under the Bush presidency. Um, Mm -hmm. But it's about sort of getting the toothpaste back in the tube. I mean, that was the kind of thing that just punched everyone in the face. And Obama's very sort of like, you know, we all hated the bailout. What isn't really clear is that, you know, everyone but Citi paid their money back by um, by late fall last year. Um, and so the damage with respect to this new, and I, I sort of personally ascribe to, <laughs> this idea of um, personal autonomy, both from a social and economic perspective, um, the damage that was done as this sort of new, maybe not that new, maybe since the 70s, this ongoing sort of um, political sort of understanding of America uh, was was severely was severely hurt by the bailouts and what followed. And I think, you know, it's not fair. It has not been yeah. fair the way the Republican Party has sort of been um, actively sort of like, you know, actively dissembling upon that point and sort of making it seem like Obama's just like, here's cash for everybody. Like, who, you know, right. and, and I think that that's shrewd of them politically. But I also think that it's incredibly unfair and dishonest um, to do that. Well, I, I think, you know, I, I'm not going to really disagree. Um, I think, I mean, that's, I think we're sort of agreeing, actually, in that, right, the, you know, the TARP was announced and passed initially under, you know, under the Bush administration. It was right. crafted by, you know, his treasury. Um, and, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, that's part of what I'm talking about, about displaced rage, uh, against, you know, the, the establishment that existed before the Obama administration was there, you know, against the Republican establishment. Um, I want to change the frame though a little bit. And that's, I really don't buy this whole frame of this is about personal autonomy and, and so on and so forth. Um, I think this is about fairness. I think this is about people feeling that they were gypped as opposed to that they're being oppressed, right? And if you look at what sort of happened in the late Bush administration and you look at what happened in the Obama administration in terms of responding to the economic crisis, there's a little bit of a continuity there. So, you know, the the TARP was passed under the Bush administration um, and was perceived, I think not entirely incorrectly, Right, as a gift to the banking sector, right? Um, the you know that 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 these that the that's an industry who and individuals in that industry profited from the fact that they were bailed out. I don't think that's a hundred percent of the story, but I don't think it's that's uh, that can be thrown out of the story. I think there are people who are richer today because of that. Um, uh, and you can see that in the fact that, uh, uh, you know, we have record profits at a lot of these companies now, and they're paying out huge bonus numbers. Um, in the Obama administration, you had the, um, uh, the stimulus bill, which, um, the biggest component of it, if I remember correctly, was, was actually, you know, a tax cut, but was sort of deliberately designed not to be noticed especially well. Um, and after that, the biggest component was direct aid to, um, uh, the states, which was designed to avoid um, uh, layoffs, right. and so you have yeah. a situation where, you know, you're you're you know a member, you're you know person who works in the private economy, and let's say you know either was laid off or is worried about being laid off, or your you know, wife was laid off, husband was laid off, you know, you see unemployment going up directly, and what you see the government doing is under both administrations spend giving money to Wall Street and giving money to government workers. Um, oh, that's not And true. I think it's Wait, the perception no, okay. of that okay. unfairness that's really driving this, rather than a kind of you know you know any any real impingement on personal freedom. Okay. You know, or autonomy. Sure. When you say fairness, you mean like responsibility, the type of responsibility that people take for themselves increasingly and expect people to take for themselves. Now, if you look at, um, you know, for example, this question of the the stimulus and its effectiveness, um, I think the administration has done a pretty terrible job at explicating that tax cuts are a part of it and explicating that um, it wasn't, yes, you know, state budgets were important, but it wasn't exactly, you know, um, it was designed to create work um, funded by the government for all sorts of folks, not just people who are civil sector employees. Um, but I just think that the people, you know, the rhetoric, I think, during a lot of the 2008 campaign was sort of like, you know, we're going to balance our budget the way you balance your family budget. And I think that's a very, like, salient political rhetorical frame. 
people understand that and they're disheartened when they see the government or a bank or an oil company um, behaving recklessly with what are which is, with either public money or the public good, which would be, I guess in this case, would be Pete, the Gulf of Mexico. And so what's frustrating is that, and this goes back to the Wrecking Crew conversation, you know, we have this incredible faith um, as Americans in individualism, at the same time that we have an incredible faith in private sector intelligence. So when British Petroleum said, hey, it's cool, we're going to take care of this, we don't really need these regulations, it's in our interest, and it is, um, to make sure that we pump oil effectively and safely. Um, what is what is denied in that sort of assessment is the fact that, you know, British Petroleum, uh, the public interest is sort of larger than the interest of British Petroleum. And yet I just, I, I think it's so, just like, something's really wrong about a space in which a company, um, which is a bureaucracy, um, is mm-hmm. treated as sacrosanct um, when a bureaucracy like the government is treated as something to be shriveled and shrunk and denigrated at every turn, even by, you know, Democrats and liberals who feel that the state is an important actor, where it's sort of, a, there's an apology for the sort of the role of government. It's like, we don't need big government or small government. We need smart government. True. But we need government. I think that, like, starting from that point of departure is something that Democrats have missed and that Republicans have exploited. And I think that, again, you know, corporate personhood and private sector intelligence are way too valued um, in the political discourse and within the way the government operates. Um, and it's just been something that I've sort of been whining about for a long time. I think it's pretty bad. I think the BP spill really, really demonstrates the extent to which um, people should feel angry about this lack of fairness. And I think that they would expect the type of responsibility that they've taken on increasingly in their own lives to be to be extended to um, private companies who can do that, the government. And I think that that right. final lap, that last connection in that equation has not been effectively used politically to say right. we want responsibility across the board in this country. Regulation is a way of enacting social responsibility. And I think once people start to realize that and once the administration starts to demonstrate that, or more effectively sell that message. Um, you, yeah, that's I think, I mean, this is, you know, this is an argument that goes back to, you know, the progressive era, right? So the, you know, the argument is that, you know, if you have concentrated private interest, you know, that's dangerous to the national interest. It's also dangerous to individuals. And, you you know, that power can be just as oppressive as any other concentration of power. And how do you respond to that? The progressive response to that was, well, you need to have um, an active, strong government that can counterbalance that and that can break up trusts and that can regulate uh, right. uh, industry and, and, and prevent, you know, abuses of various kinds and, and serve as a, a countervailing center of power. Um, and I guess the kind of... I mean, there's a there's a there's a critique of that that comes. Um, I would I would say most strongly from a kind of um, localist uh, precinct, and there's there's sort of libertarian and communitarian variants of that. That kind of argues no, actually, big concentrated government power winds up colluding with these other sources of power that it doesn't and serve as effective check. There's ample evidence of check. that being the case, right? Right. And I mean, and and I think not you know, regulating BP is one of them. What's that? Not regulating BP is one of them. I mean, the collusion exists. It's not in anyone's imagination. The problem no, of course is just not. Like, it, it pollutes the entire enterprise of advocating for government um, in a way the Democrats have struggled to to counter to, to countervail for 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 ages um, right. since then, perhaps. Um, the, the the current sort of anger, I think, is justified across the board for every single American, including myself. The question is, what avenues for recourse? currently exists within and without our political system. Um, I think that um, this question of sort of, someone mentioned this at a talk I was at recently, Obama's making all these grand gestures to the center, which is like having a sort of somewhat centrist, neutered healthcare bill, having a sort of modest energy bill, having sort of incrementalist, um, however comparatively sort of amazing um, and surprising changes and and, and, and uh, new lawmaking. Um, but at the same time, you know, there's no one there. Mm-hmm. There's no one at the center. And I think that, that 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 point was really well taken 
for well, me. There's, there's lots of people at the center. There's some of the least appealing people in politics. There are people right. like uh, Charlie Crist and uh, Arnold Morgan. Spector and, and those right. sorts, right? That's your center. But so look, so right? it's Tuesday, the they people all leave. who are, you know, utterly willing to do whatever to remain in power and, and don't stand for anything at all. And Okay. We should we need I to mean, talk about the Dale Peterson video. Because I think, like, at the same time that people are very angry, the outlets, like, the ways in which people are, are finding recourse to this are fascinating. So I know mm-hmm. that you watch this video, and it's like, Dale Peterson is yeah. running for some, like, local, he's running for, like, agriculture commissioner, commissioner in, some county, in Alabama, yeah. In Alabama. And this video is probably, like, the greatest, the greatest political ad that I've seen, like, in a long time. Um, it's perfectly timed. It's incredibly sort of like, I'm, it, it's like Scott Brown was just kidding about that truck because Scott Brown's like a rich guy. This guy's Uh riding a horse. He's got this shotgun and he's going on and on about how, you know, these fat, he's actually criticizing a Republican for being corrupt and for being complicit in the sort of, well, he's um, running in the primary. Exactly. Um, and I think that this response to the climate of sort of distaste for institutional politics um, is brilliant because it is decentralized, right? I mean, this guy, like, recorded a YouTube video. And YouTube is five years old today, hooray. Um, and it sort of just, like, went viral, at least within, like, the political class. And hopefully, you know, he'll get a lot of airplay um, free on or, or, or media because of it. Um, yeah, I, but it's I wonder, response. is there any polling in Alabama on the Agriculture Commissioner primary? I because wins. I... <laughs> I'm always sort of mildly skeptical of my perceptions and and what what you know of something that's you know so far outside of the world that I actually operate in, right? right. Um, I mean, something can go viral on YouTube and be enormously you know popular and 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 actually be a losing message in an actual election. It that might be true, say, I just, but the, 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 the I, points I that he's the points that he's emphasizing are his outsidership, his authenticity. Um, via, like, hot horse, cowboy hat, like, whatever, his sort mm-hmm. of, like, give it to him straight, like, um, you know, I'll tell those, I mean, everyone should watch the video. It's remarkable. Um, and mm-hmm. I do think that it taps into the sense of, like, I mean, he sounds angry. It's not, you know, I'm whatever, Dale Peterson and I approve this message. It's not like a, a, a woman speaking in dulcet tones about his record. He's like, I was a Marine. I fought in Vietnam. I think, and, you know, he's waving a, a shotgun around in, in this sort of like, um, it's sort of almost, um, it's just very fraught with sort of the, like a tension where you feel like there's, a, there's almost a sort of a hint of, of uh, violence, I would even say. Um, mm-hmm. And it's just that, People are finding new ways of articulating their anger in a way that, you know, I'm disappointed that progressives have not been able to channel it as effectively as they did when they were out of power via organizations such as Move On. Um, Now you have the sort of Tea Party, which, you know, I think does have some legitimacy as a sort of grassroots uh, movement. Mm -hmm. But, But I think that angry liberals or angry moderates do not have a brand around which they can rally. Um, not one nearly as salient as the Tea Party or the personal brand that this candidate is cultivating. There is nothing for them to affiliate with in a way that is as large scale and as openly hostile to the current government as do Republicans. And I think that that masks democratic anger in a way that um, maybe maybe doesn't really allow us to predict how November will unfold. I guess, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to step back a little bit from sort of this immediate political moment, because um, I guess the way I look at politics is that um, I come from a fairly elitist perspective. You know, I tend to think that the agendas of, you know, what's actually going to get done is are driven by different groups of elites as well as by individuals uh, within those groups. Um, and that the struggle then is to, um, you know, kind of capture the people, as opposed to the people moving elites in a particular direction. Um, and, you know, the the sort of the promise of democracy is that, you know, ultimately the people have some kind of a veto. I don't, I don't believe elections particularly reflect the popular will. I don't think there is such a thing as the popular will. I honestly don't think the Tea Party has any coherent agenda of any kind. Um, 
But what you hope is that because you have regular elections and you can throw the bums out, that every now and again, if things get bad enough and people are unhappy enough, they can just do that. And that the fear of that is something that forces you know, the political elites to occasionally pay attention to the interests of the people, uh, hopefully more than occasionally. Um, well, yeah, okay. I mean, I think maybe we should, like, transition into another topic, sure. which I think is relevant. It's germane to your point. Which is that, like, how how much of political how much how much of democratic outcomes reflect popular will and popular understanding? I mean, part of that is just sort of do people have the tools to exercise democracy effectively? I would say no, um, and that's not meant, you know, as a sort of g- a well, that, jab. Well, that that depends on what you think democracy is for. But, you know, if you think that democracy is about enacting the people's will, then I think you have a real problem because no, no I I'm think most people like, who actually just, are in government don't have the tools to do that, much less the people voting. Um, Look, I mean, if you can gin up, like, a bunch of, I mean, if you can get someone by flashing the Constitution and waving a gun around in an ad to vote for you, then is that a reflection of the popular will? If you can get people incensed, and and this guy in the ad also mentions illegals, I don't know if that's a big issue in Alabama, mm -hmm. but it's, like, a sort of keyword, right, for what will be increasingly an issue, I think, this fall and this summer, um... If you get someone to vote for you by sort of, like, mentioning these buzzwords without, you know, you, you draw people in who aren't interested in the entire constellation of issues before them so much as they're interested in single um, sort of uh, perhaps inflammatory um, subjects. And, and is that a reflection of popular will? I would also say no. I, I just... um, but I think the immigration conversation is going to be a nasty one, and it's going to happen all summer, and I think... You know, Republicans are, are positioning themselves sometimes at odds with their prior positions in a way to sort of maximize um, the pain it will inflict on wishy-washy Democrats um, all summer. Yeah, I don't know. Um, immigration is sort of a funny topic because the people for whom that's sort of their bet noir, you know, where this is their issue, you know, predict every election cycle that it's going to be the dominant issue. Um, yes. And um, and sometimes they turn out to have a point. Sometimes they don't. So it's 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 sort of hard to know. Um, I, think, I think it's good for I think both the, parties the, to be talking about immigration. Sorry. I think it's good for Democrats and Republicans to be talking about immigration politically. For Republicans, it offers them um, a sort of again a flashpoint for people who are either openly nativist or just economically insecure in ways that lead them to blame immigrants for some of their economic hardships. Mm -hmm. And for Democrats, it's something that can pry away people who are uh, horrified at that sort of mentality and also sort of solidify um, what's an increasingly obvious sort of demographic shift um, in the country um, as the party that is inclusive and welcoming of immigrant communities um, a.k.a. the entire country. Right. But I think for both parties, it's actually good, and I'm surprised it hasn't been more salient. I guess... It was supposed to be the 08, you know, issue, and it wasn't. Mm. Um, but I think both parties can see an advantage in talking about immigration. I think, by definition, in an electoral sense, nothing can be good for both parties, right? It, if it's good, it right. has to be, like, it's a zero-sum well, game in an election. Yeah. And so, to say something's good for both parties, to me that means this is an issue where both of us can... Um, like, like, and it, my, my definition of an issue that's good for both parties is something that sort of keeps change from happening. Change meaning electoral change, right? Both parties want to keep whoever they've got in power in power, and so something that's good for both parties is something that accomplishes that. I mean, like um, increasing turnout. I, I think like people are going to what, what, what I think like what you're saying it. is that immigration is a good, um sorting mechanism, right? That sort of if immigration is a live issue, it is accelerating the trends that we've seen already in the last 20 years, sorting the parties out uh, and demographically. Yes. And I guess the larger point I'd make on that is that that sorting process is one that I find problematic in terms of the future of um uh, of the, uh, of of America. Well, I don't want to be melodramatic. Say the future of American I would democracy. Say the future of I think it has. Democracy. I think it has deleterious effects on American democracy. And the reason is, what you're saying is basically kind of folks who you know, white voters who see that identity as important and important reason for voting are going to sort sort increasingly the Republican camp, and we have seen that. And um, uh, ethnic minorities um, sort increasingly. 
uh, into the Democratic camp, and I think you've seen that as well. Certainly, since um, you know, since the '80s, uh, we've seen uh, a, a, a considerable shift in that direction. Um, not so much among African Americans, but among other um, uh, uh, ethnic minorities, moving more into the Democrat into the Democratic column. Um, right. And I think that identity politics, as such, whether it's right wing or left wing identity politics, is the enemy of accountable government. You know, because if you can mobilize voters, right? If the goal is for elites to capture voters and thereby retain power or achieve power, if you can do that without promising to do anything. But by saying, I'm your kind of people, right, that's good for the elites, right? If you need to actually sure. deliver something, right, if you're judged not by identity but by results, then um, it's harder for you as whatever yeah, elite you are really, to you've retain your finger or achieve on, power. You've put your finger on the difference between the sort of politics of immigration and the policy of immigration. I mean, Mexican President Calderon is coming for a state visit this week. It's been planned for a long time, but it arrives at a moment when we're talking about the uh, various laws in Arizona that are on the books now that with respect to uh, ethnic studies in schools, with respect to racial profiling. Um, and I think that insofar as the politics of those particular conversations um, are, those dynamics are as you've described them, I think that the policy that deserves to be sort of um, – will be discussed during Calderon's visit with respect to Mexico um, is the more interesting and the more difficult. And I think that if people can sort of, maybe if their sort of desire for um, on both sides of the aisle, a political advantage based on talking about immigration, if that can lead to a constructive policy discussion around the issue of immigration reform, then I think all to the better. Um, but there are serious issues. There's, you know, the question of, Yes, it's racial profiling law um, in Arizona. Mm -hmm. I think it's likely that you see, you'll see the president who's already spoken out against it. There's been talk that perhaps the Justice Department would issue some sort of memo sort of condemning it and asking for um, a review it, sort of nationally. Um, there's evidence that, um, you know, Calderon, when he addresses Congress on Thursday, a joint session, which is rare, and I think the first in the Obama presidency, um, will take ownership, will, will first critique, you know, the president um, and Arizona sort of in no uncertain terms because his public in Mexico is expecting him to do so. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll also sort of, I am hearing, make a case for Mexican responsibility in this dynamic, um, at least with respect to border security, where it's like we need to provide opportunities for people in Mexico such that the brain drain um, right. or I don't know what the, you know, or manual labor drain is not um, Well, that's, you know, providing opportunities in Mexico is in many ways easier said than done. Right. I mean, right. the two things I mean, that we could probably do best to provide more opportunities in Mexico or that the, the world could do best probably are reducing agricultural subsidies in the United States and letting the Chinese currency uh, uh, appreciate more against the dollar. Right. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, Mexico has very, very longstanding um, economic problems. Um, in some ways, those have gotten better in the last generation. In other ways, um, they've gotten worse. I mean, inequality in Mexican society, is, it, it's, it may have gotten actually more dramatic um, as the top has pulled so much further away um, from the rest of the country, even as you know the middle class has grown. Um, the, uh, um, you know, I, I think I, I would be surprised if Americans were more concerned uh, about figuring out how to fix Mexico's long-term economic problems than the Mexican people, uh, whether or not the Mexican political system is especially responsive well, that to their be, needs that is, is another question. That would be a new <laughs> element of the discourse on immigration bi bilaterally between Mexico and the United States. If, and I, I expect that he will, if Calderon makes this sort of argument about Mexico needing to sort of bear its own burden. And this is something that mm -hmm. the State Department um, under Hillary Clinton has emphasized, and that Obama and Calderon, who have met frequently, I think probably more than any other head of state since, mm -hmm. other than, than the Canadian prime minister. They have met, you know, the G20, Obama was down there during the swine flu right. sort of incident, and, and you know, they, they have a close working relationship, and I think that they are on the same page about mutuality of responsibility, and I think it's on Obama to sort of tamp down the sort of, like, nativist rhetoric that you're hearing from folks 
like his opponent, John McCain, you know, from 2008. Right, um, which is quite of ironic, right, right? considering who he was exactly. until 2006. That's right. Or, now, I just think, like, the whole sort of conversation about Mexico and the U.S., Latin America and the U.S., as the immigration problem mm-hmm. is just fundamentally flawed. And I thought that for a long time as a first generation American, um, my parents came here in 1983 right. um, through the front door, as it were, you know, uh, as medical students. And I think that that would be one, almost impossible today, but also the entire apparatus of immigration with respect to the INS, with respect to the state department, um, the front door, if you will, is a completely different, but equally sort of flawed, um, uh, flawed administration yeah. as is the, the, the southern border of the United States, a.k.a. At the back door. And I'm just surprised that that's not more um, discussed. Well, I think it's politically as, salient as in, you know, reform. places like Silicon Valley or, or, or any of the other, um, you know, Seattle or any other part of the country where you have industries that have a big component of, you know, H-1B holders playing important right. roles. Um, and those are some of the most economically important parts of the country. Um, I just don't think they're the same conversation at all. I think that, um, and, and, and I wonder whether, you know, tying them together, you know, the, the biggest problem probably dealing with that issue, right, with how do we have a freer, uh, more open labor market for the top of the labor market, right, for highly skilled uh, uh, individuals, Probably the biggest problem in dealing with that is that it's it's framed as part of uh, the same conversation that involves what are we doing about the fact that we share this enormous border with a country that is producing you know more surplus you know unskilled laborers than they can employ productively. Um, right. It's uh, you know, do you because think they're, they're, they're not, they have the nothing economically or politically or in any way really to do with each other, except for the, the fact that they're both to do with the INS and, and how we, you know. Uh, I disagree. Um, I think that Arizona, you know, the state where all of this sort of is coming to a head because the federal government hasn't acted. Um, former Governor Janet Napolitano runs the Department of Homeland Security. Right. Um, and I'm increasingly, and I'm not, I haven't fully fleshed out my ideas on this subject, but I think... There is an argument to be made um, for whoever wants to go first, whichever political party or whichever constituency group, and I don't know that anyone is arguing this. There's an argument to be made that our homeland security is not about, you know, Ciudad Juarez and the violence that is spilling into southern towns um, in the United States from northern towns in Mexico. Um, but homeland security, you know, certainly if you look at Shahzad, uh, Faisal Shahzad, the man who tried to blow up... Uh, Times Square recently, that man held an H-1B visa until he became an American citizen. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, what, what, how can someone make a sort of comprehensive, people say comprehensive immigration reform, but they don't mean it. When they say comprehensive immigration reform, they're talking about like radar at the border and possibly the fence and possibly a path to citizenship for those already within our borders who are illegal. I'm talking about like an actually comprehensive idea um, designed to sort of like advantage the American state that comprises not just the front door, but the back door, but also the front door. Well, Why did Shahzad have a visa? All right, I'll, I'll throw out my, can... my own preferred sort of solution to the whole immigration mess, which is, right. you know, I, I, and, and I've sort of come to this relatively late in the game, but, um, you know, it's, it's not clear to me why the government needs to be in the business of figuring out who, you know, from an economic perspective, you know, who deserves a visa, right? It seems to me that the efficient solution would be to have the government put a price on it and then auction them, right? If you had Congress deciding each year we're going to have this many visas available, you know, and this many green cards available, and we're just going to auction them off to the highest bidder. Employer can, you know, bid up for them if they want to be able to hire people from abroad, and your individual can do it if they want to come here to go to school, and uh, the I, you know, the International Rescue Committee can buy them if they want to get them to uh, political refugees or whatever, and, um, and, you know, it would be a source of revenue for the Treasury, and you could let the INS spend their time trying to figure out, make sure that, you know, somebody who's getting a visa isn't a criminal or isn't a terrorist or whatever, and get out of the business of figuring whether they really deserve to get a job in this country. And then if you work here illegally and you don't belong here, somebody has defrauded the government of uh, revenue because you didn't buy yourself a visa like you were supposed to. 
And the IRS, I feel like, is pretty good at finding those people and, uh, and taking their money. Okay. I think that's really regressive because the, the, the value of a visa or a path to citizenship in the United States would outstrip even whatever price that we could put on it, obviously, because the economic mobility and the social mobility in the United States is better even than, you know, I would say the, the UK or whatever. Um, but it's also no matter what the price you put on it. It wouldn't. Well, I don't know what that means. Tiered it would outstrip the price, right? The price by kind of by definition would be to what America, people are willing to pay the for. The value of right? coming to America um, is astronomical. The amount of freedom that we have, um, the amount of sort of uh, modern technology that we have access to and take for granted. I don't know. What would you guess the clearing price enormous. would be? Let's say there were 500,000 visas available a year. Let's say there were a million available. What do you think the clearing price would be? How much would people really be willing to spend for one? I don't even want to get into that. It's going to be unaffordable for perhaps the most talented non-Americans around the world. And I think that that would sort of be, it would be pointless. It would be like a rich person's lottery. It would be like, and look, you know, think about um, the, really? the Underbomber. Yeah, look. Wait, okay, I'm sorry. So you're talented, and let's say... No, let's use... No, but what do you think the number would be, really? Like, what... Are you saying people would pay a million dollars? The price of Like, a million people would pay a million dollars? Are we talking about, like, a hundred dollars? No, no, I'm figuring it would probably be in the tens of thousands is where it would wind up. I think that that's incredibly regressive, and I think it would be a shame to put put an economic barrier to entry to the United States for people outside the country. I think it would exacerbate the resentment, perhaps, that people who are trying to come through the front door feel for people who just, by virtue of geographic proximity to the United States, can just become part of the United States community. And I think that if someone who is incredibly intelligent, who has been um, educated as an engineer or a doctor in, say, Cairo, right. but cannot afford to come to the United States to pay tens of thousands of dollars for a visa... That is a negative for that person. It is a negative for the United States because we don't have a highly skilled. Uh, why are you assuming that we would get immigrant? less if we if we auctioned them? Why do you assume we would get less skilled people as opposed to more skilled people? I would think that if I were no, Google, but, but skill, right, I'd be in the best skill? position to buy the visas and just take that as like, okay, this is like a signing bonus. We've got to pay twenty thousand dollars to get the engineer we want from Bangalore. You're why would about Google pick the less skilled or individuals? Person? Are you talking about private companies versus individuals? Because there's a lottery every right. year where there's like an allocation of certain types of visas. Um, I mean, right now, right now, if you're Google and you want to hire somebody from abroad, right, you have to jump through a whole bunch of economically meaningless hoops to prove that there's no American who can do the job, and then you get to, you know, and then you get to hire them. You tailor the job listing in order to make it as difficult as possible for an American to, you know, line up. You find the guy you want in. India or Japan or China or wherever it is, and then you, you know, try to make it seem like the job you want to hire them for can only be filled by this individual. And it's this sort of absurd exercise, right, that pays nobody any money, right, and just wastes everybody's time, right? Sorry, Why are we going through that process? Sorry, no, just to clarify, you were talking about private companies paying per visa in order to give them... Gratis. I mean, it's a it's a it's a it's, outside it's, the U.S. Or sorry, I just I just misunderstood yeah, sure. you earlier. Or are you talking about an individual who would like to come to America, paying whatever price for a visa and a path to citizenship? Which is it? Uh, I let's leave citizenship out of it because I think other considerations come in, right? So a green card is not citizenship. But I mean, are you talking about individuals or companies? I don't think I'm making a distinction. If you've got something for I think sale, this is a terrible can idea, for it. Noah. I can no, buy I it for you, idea. and you can buy it for you. With, but but you're. I think that you're. You're. you're I mean, I, it's not obvious to me that Harvard would of people's buy up a whole bunch of these in order to bring the, best the United States. The world over. Look, I think. Look, I think the best and the brightest from outside of America's borders mm-hmm. should be allowed the lowest barrier to entry possible to the United States. Who's going to decide who's the best and the brightest? When you that is prohibitive. What is, when you decide, well, you're saying that it's based on how much money they have. No, I'm basing if it. If someone on, is wealthy, I, I you're saying they're right. likely to be talented. I think the best and brightest. Would have lots and lots of people who want to bring them here, and lots of and those people would be eager to pay a, really a small fee in order to get them here. I think that's a very flawed assumption. I think your assumption think that is that the government's in the best position to decide who the best and brightest are, and should sort that out and then invite them over here. I'm just saying, why not let everybody figure that out? 
why make the government the arbiter of who the best and brightest are and allocating on that basis. Right now, that's not what we do, right? Right now, we allocate, like, yeah, Okay, so a, how is Google going to get in here. touch with, like, a really intelligent programmer in, like, mm-hmm. uh, in, like, Nairobi? Yeah. Like, they're just going to be emailing? I mean, I just think that your, your understanding of the mobility that people have, both economically and professionally, outside of the United States, is overstated. I mean, I think people go through a long process of trying to apply to, to, to schools in the United States mm-hmm. or for graduate study in the United mm-hmm. States. Um, or for work in the United States, and primarily the sort of first line of defense involves a local embassy. Well, let me let me, so let me put it let me put it this way: like having you a know, private company is just like overly optimistic. I think. Let me put it this way: the people who are sneaking in the back door are frequently paying thousands of dollars to coyotes to drag them through the desert, and these are the people with the least means, with the least ability to say, you know, I could get, you know, I have you know skills to sell in this country. So the idea that that by saying you know, okay, let's put a price on the front door and set the price at the level that the market actually will bear is going to result in worse people coming in. Strikes me as really unlikely. It doesn't sound like the way markets work at all. How about, how about, how about the government, for example, increases the number of H1B, H1B visas that are available because every year they have a certain number and companies will say, we would like, 40 of these, yeah. right? And there's and, and there's a sort of, like, bickering process where you then decide how right. many... Yeah, right, yeah, I want to get rid of all of that. Ab- ...allowed to offer. I, what if the government... I want to get rid of all of that. ...the number... I just... I think, I think it's a ridiculous idea. I'm sorry. I just do. I mean, especially because it puts a price on it that can be extremely restrictive for folks who aren't advantaged um, and who might then, you know, be excluded from coming to America um, based on a price point. Yeah, it seems, it's, point, it seems to me, point that, right now you've got a system where you have to have connections to get here. And I'm suggesting having a system where it's very open you how you get here and really straightforward. To get to this country now, connections what's that? To get into, you don't, I think that's inaccurate. You don't need connections to get into the United States. Obviously, folks like um, Shahzad, folks like Umar Muttalib or Abdul Muttalib yeah. are folks who are, um, elites within their home country, exactly, and therefore have the education and the access that might expedite their visa process. Right, exactly. In, That's in my theory, point. In theory, I'm saying it's. But again, the idea of having a price on that would only would ensure that only <laughs> the people of their class. Could have access. I think that's. Right I think that's process, backwards, right? However, like the the more restrictive wait, you make the process, and the more you make it political, the more likely that only people with connections can get in. And the more open you make it, and the more you say, "Look, we really want anyone who wants to come here who's not planning to kill people to have an opportunity." And we know that there's, you know, and we know there's value to that opportunity. We're not willing to invite literally everyone in the world to come here. Let's figure out what that value is in a you know open process. That I seems to me like the most yeah. open way. Of Sorry, you, just, you haven't let me. You haven't let me finish. I think that you're mischaracterizing the current state of affairs for the quote unquote front door. I think that people who have connections are more likely to get visas to enter the United States and to stay in the United States and have multiple entries because some people, you know, get a type of visa where they can come once and they can't leave, or once they're done with their their schooling, they have to go. And some of them overstay their visas, and that's a big part of the 12 million who are in the United States illegally. Um, but in theory. Anyone can sort of come, can apply for a visa. Mm-hmm. The problem is that there are a smaller number of visas. So the solution... What do you think the right if number is? Broaden, if we're trying to broaden access, would be to increase the number of... To what? What uh, do you think the right number is? worker visas. You know, I don't actually know what the number is right now, so I couldn't say. But I imagine we could probably sustain having twice the number of highly skilled workers from other countries instead of saying every other one can't come. How many of the but visas should be available for highly it, skilled people t- from other countries versus family members of people who are already here? What in terms perc- of a ratio? No, just just how what percentage? How would you split it up? Well, I don't think those are the only two sort of dynamics. The, I don't the, think the biggest only dynamic only is and- family members, is family unification. That's the biggest reason people get visas. So For would visiting, you get rid of those? Families who, pardon? Would you get rid of those? Would you say we're going to end family reunification and just invite, you know, we're going to get, get rid of that classification of visa? No, I don't think so. I just think that right now, like, we have a very, I mean, I would imagine that, so what? What, how, wait, yeah. Hold on. Okay, so, sorry. Just Noah, you need to let me talk. Bye. Okay? Sorry. All right. Sorry. So I think that um, the political problem of immigration, as I mentioned earlier, has been extraordinarily focused on the southern border, and I think that has led to a policy form- formation that is 
as interested in keeping the numbers of immigrants to the United States low. It was exacerbated by what happened after 9-11 and the Patriot Act and the number of folks coming from countries like China, you know, that weren't particularly part of the apparatus of terror we were so worried about. The number of visas extended to highly skilled workers from countries like China dropped yep. um, during the 2000s. So I think, again, the, the political relevance of southern border immigration, like, fear um, has, has actively obstructed the sort of type of type of immigration that we want. And so I think, and I'm not sure about any specific concrete numbers, I think that we could probably afford to increase the quota of highly skilled visas available to immigrants to the United States. I, I don't I do disagree with that. that. Putting, I think we're on the same finish, side on I that I think one. that putting a price point on that would actually have a regressive effect in that people who could not afford to pay the tens of thousands of dollars or whatever it is that we've decided is going... The, the, the price of a visa would be, or who do not have access to the type of multinational corporations that would sponsor them, or American companies that would sponsor them, those people will be shut out, which I think would be a negative outcome, which is why I'm against the idea of attaching a specific price, but rather favor the government, which currently administers this, significantly reforming the way that they deal with immigration policy through the front and the back door. And I lament the fact that the back door is all we've been talking about, particularly given um, how important it is that we effectively, efficiently, and, max, and in maximal in ways that maximize American interests, deal with immigration at the front door. That's all I'm saying. Okay. And I just think putting a price point on it is gonna is gonna hurt more people than it helps. Okay. I, I guess I take the other side of that. I think that the problem you have is that the back door and the front door are connected in the popular imagination when they actually have nothing to do with each other. And the question is kind of how do you, from well, a political perspective, cut that cord? How do you make this not about, hey, we want to bring more, you know, we, you know we're know, we pro-increasing immigration or anti-increasing immigration. I think putting, no, I think putting some – wait, now, now it's my turn to talk and you get to wait for me to be finished. I think, um, you know, and this is, you know, more of a thought experiment than anything else because I don't think anybody's ever going to do this. But I'm just sort of suggesting that – the fact that the general public doesn't see that there's any value to them directly, right, and there's clearly an enormous amount of value in the opportunity to come and work in the United States is something that you could solve, right? I also think that having a great deal of political process around who, how many H-1Bs are issued and who is more deserving of being coming here, do we need nurses or do we need programmers or do we need this – this is the whole kind of conversation that happens, um, you know, in the political process if, uh, you know, and, and I don't see where the government's adding a lot of value there when the market could sort this out perfectly well just like they do with domestic labor markets, right? And the market figures well, yeah, out what's worth, you know, bringing somebody from Ohio to Oklahoma to take this job. There's going to be a cost to doing that, you know, and the market sorts that out. And sometimes companies are willing to pay people to do it and sometimes people are willing to pay themselves to make that move. Um, it seems to me that, you know, assuming out of the gate that letting the market figure that out is going to be detrimental is contrary to the way we handle, you know, all employment situations domestically. Why should we assume the that? Reason, the reason that the government has got to be involved in the federal process of approving immigrants to the United States or allowing immigrants to become citizens who are already in the United States, whatever this comprehensive reform ends up looking like, is because, is because it's important to know who's coming in. I think a private company might have seen, let's say Elizabeth Arden saw a lot of value in Faisal Shahzad. And so they sponsored his visa. They sponsored his pact to citizenship. Mm -hmm. He became a citizen. Two months later, he left and then came back and tried to blow up Times Square. I think, you know, that perhaps illustrates the difficulties of having markets and private companies alone really? manage the issue of intake. So yeah, should we assume that the should we assume that the guy I don't think the government should we well, assume, I'm not saying the government's particularly effective at this screening. I mean obviously like, you know, they've given two sort of high profile visas to terrorists or right. suspected terrorists in the last year or so. Um, but I do so, think it, it So let me ask you a question. The, if, to deal with the guy that. who uh, the guy who shot up people at that uh, military base, right? Should Malik we assume Hassan. that because that happened, that therefore the army is not the right people to figure out whether people like that are in their ranks? Like, it seems to be making policy on the basis of, you know, one bad visa or one sort of, you know, bad situation. No, I'm arguing sort of that, that, 
No, but again, what I'm saying is that Elizabeth Arden sponsored Faisal Shahsan, but ultimately it was, you know, whatever local immigration officials, um, including, you know, the INS and the State Department, approved his path to citizenship. And I'm just saying having a more sort of <sighs> focusing more on that, I think, instead of focusing on building a useless fence, would be like a more appropriate type of contemporary immigration reform policy. Um, especially as, again, if we really broaden our conception of homeland security, that is a significant part of it. Um, yeah, I'd I think, be again, in, the government yeah, I, don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not aware of sort of much in the way of what is being proposed as a way of uh, kind of profiling people better to make sure that we don't let in uh, people who might ultimately well, become is, terrorists. I, I think there's a very good reason to try to avoid having – criminals coming into the country, right? And that's certainly a big issue on the on the backdoor side of things uh, that people talk about. But in terms of accidentally giving visas to people who, you know, wind up becoming terrorists, um, you know, if they, uh, you know, I, I mean, the easiest solutions are probably things that you would wind up opposing, right? You know, I mean, we could just not give, you know, we could just not give visas to anybody who's been to Afghanistan, right? Or anyone who's been to Pakistan. We don't want to do that, right? So... Yeah, no, I think, but again, like, focusing efforts on reforming those mechanisms so that they are more precise and so they are not racially profiling. I mean, you saw after the uh, Christmas Day incident, they had a list of 14 countries that just, like, we're going to get extra screening. Like, that's imprecise. Um, I think greater precision will follow greater attention to the question of visa allocation. Hmm. Um, And I just, I just, I just mean to suggest that it should be part of the conversation on immigration reform. I do think we should change gears. We have been talking a while. I know that there's like a couple of things. Um, How long are we supposed to do this for, by the way? It's like been a little over an hour. It depends. It's been an hour. Um, I don't know if you still want to talk about um, any Obama books. I know that was something that was of interest to you. I know that there are a whole slew of them. I have a couple of them. You can't see this now on the shelf behind me. Um, I did a review of The Bridge by David Remnick. Uh-huh. And uh, I did a little bit of reporting um, for Jonathan Alter's new book, The Promise, Um and I just wonder what you make of the sort of industry of Obama books um, or whether or not, you know, they're sort of um, almost premature, I would say, to have a bunch of them after the guy's only been on the public scene for like, what, You know, five, it's, it's a little tough to say that books about somebody who's written two autobiographies of himself um, are premature, right? Um, but I guess, you know, I haven't read the Obama books that have come out, so I can't really speak to them Um Directly, but I would be interested in hearing whether you know whether you think there's anything interesting as a pattern in the way uh, Obama's presented in these books. I think that the American far right um, there is uh, uh, an increasing um, there's a trope uh, as to Obama's you know that that the people don't present him as he really is. You know dot 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 you know, some sort of sinister insinuation following that. Um, And I'm curious whether that, you know, I think basically unjustified, you know, meme that's in the air has, uh, is either um, a spur to some of this uh, biographizing and whether, you know, you sense it in the background as, as, as something to be refuted in any of it. I mean, Barack Obama is already a historical figure. Um, I think it's always interesting to find portraits of him that are non-ideological, but purely biographical, honestly, just because I think he's an interesting person and he's also in such a bubble that any sort of insight into, you know, is he a yeller? Um, you know, what was it like when he was facing Hillary Clinton? And I'm as interested in the sort of game change sort of campaign playbook, um, as I am in a really thoughtful sort of history textbook, um, and biography such as the bridge. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, but I don't think that has any bearing on, like, policy whatsoever. I mean, I think it's just, like, Obama is a public figure like any other. Um, some A lot of this is sort of, like, after the fact sort of, like, uh, documentation as opposed to sort of, it's just not helpful in the present. It's not helpful for, like, how he might govern because I think characterological stuff, like, isn't really very helpful in talking about policy. Um, the type of person you are, you know, has no bearing on the kind of president you'll be, but I still find the type of person you might be to be interesting, I, said, I suppose. You think that the type of person you are has no bearing on the kind of president you'll be? Is that what I heard? Yeah. I mean, I think I probably would imagine, like, 
it's probably more fun to hang out with George Bush than John Kerry, you know, which is what everyone sort of said. But I, I just, it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that, that their, that their presidencies would be, I would prefer one to the other. I think it'd probably be the inverse. Huh? Yeah. I guess I take, if I, if I heard you right, if I understood you right, I take the other side of that one. I think, um, I, I think the, the main thing that determines kind of what, um, you know, what happens, the two main things that matter, right, are, you know, events that you have no way of predicting, right, that mm-hmm. present you with challenges that were never discussed in the campaign, right? 9-11 was nothing that came up in uh, the 2000 right. campaign, like- right? And um, and after that, what political party you're in, right? You know, if you're a Republican, you can reasonably know that certain things are going to follow. If you're a Democrat, you can reasonably know that certain things are going to follow. It's not going to be wildly unexpected from, you know, from those, you know, knowing what the political coalition is and what, you know, the parties have stood for, you know, in the in the immediate past. Um, but... Um, but well, after look at that, what to Obama in healthcare, he wasn't even like all about healthcare during the campaign. No, he didn't run on it at all, Not practically. Ever, right, and then was just, and then I, I sort of thought he was going to do like energy, and look where that's happened. Right, like climate legislation is sort of like not; it's like a non-starter. So it's just not helpful to look at past as prologue, right? And I think I'm more interested in like. So I was recently on a panel with Ryan Lizza, who has the unenviable task of also writing a book about Barack Obama. Um, to compete with that of his editor at The New Yorker, David Remnick. Uh-huh. And he told an anecdote about what he's written four profiles of Obama since like 2004, which is probably the most of any working journalist and is now writing a book about who knows what, you know, his next couple of years in office. Um, and Obama was like, listen, he was at a briefing or something. Um, and this was back when he was just become a senator and he was doodling uh, on a piece of paper during the briefing. And Lisa got a look at it and it was like a picture of himself. Right. Um, and, and then sort of, you know, the next time Ryan saw him, Obama sort of like made him know that he was annoyed that he had written that. Right. Um, you know, he's like, I can't doodle anymore, you know, and sort of gave him like a, a look. Uh, but I think that's very interesting because I think Barack Obama is incredibly vain. I think his vanity perhaps tells us more about what type of president he wants to be. I think he wanted to do health care so he could be historical. I think he takes jabs at Clinton, Bill Clinton, so that he can be historical. Mm-hmm. So that he can separate himself from um, a president operating with a smaller majority in a different America. Um, and I think he's always got an eye to, like, this, all the Lincoln stuff, you know. What do you think his vanity is actually story, about? You know? Like, what do you think he's vain about? I think he's vain about how people perceive him. I think he really wants to be liked. But I also think, unlike Bill Clinton, who works for your your, your affections... Do you think he wants Obama to be liked? Because like, he strikes me as I somebody think, who um, is very, very willing relative to your average politician to not be liked by somebody like certainly compared to a Bill Clinton who you feel like, you know, you know, wants everyone in the world to love him. You know, mm-hmm. um, I have, I have a sense that Barack Obama is, is as a Paul, you know, as a politician is much more comfortable, um, having, uh, you know, he doesn't seem phased particularly by, um, you know, having people dislike him. Um, okay, I think that that's accurate. But I also think Obama is advantaged by something that some people call black male privilege, which is the sort of being clean and articulate in ways that like make people say you're a hottie with a little body or whatever that woman said. Mm-hmm. I think in rooms since he was a child, and Remnick does a good job of sketching this out, he has been an object of fascination and sort of like almost sort of like cloying admiration. Mm-hmm. Um, and that has probably colored the way he moves through rooms even today, where he sort of gets um, the benefit of the doubt. Um, it's not quite affirmative action, but people listen to him um, in part because he is, yes, he is charming, but he is also um, unexpected. And so he destabilizes individuals in ways that allow them to give him the benefit of doubt. And I think that that's the sort of thing that, you know, the Harvard Law Review and all that. And right. People are just, people, people expect things of him, I think, in ways because, because he's a black man. And when he uh, cuts against Is it that people expect things of him or people are eager to give him things? 
because expecting things from somebody. I think people are very eager to give Barack Obama things. Yeah, I think that's accurate. more accurate. And I think what what would be interesting in terms of his character is if you grow up being used, that's a very sort of aristocratic position to be in, right? If you're the yes. sort of person, right? And it's someone who's, who's sort of to the manor born, you know, a, a, a Prince Charles, let's say, right? Grows up, you know, in, in an environment where, you know, everybody wants to, you know, do things for them and give things, you know, to them. And, and, and you grow up sort of expecting that, right? Um, you know, Obama obviously did not come from a particularly privileged background at all. He came from, from, from a very ordinary background. But like Elena Kagan, he's um, learned to walk the walk, right? What's that? I mean, and a little bit like Kagan, I think, uh, Ezra Klein wrote a great post about how they're like basically the same person. I think that's probably true. You learn how to talk. I mean, there's a segment in, in Remnick's book that mm-hmm. sort of deals with that where it's like, you know, he learned how to talk to the people who are the conservatives at Harvard, and at the same time that he learned how to sort of, like, get along with the, the, the misfits at Occidental. Uh, right. And he just has this chameleonism and this sort of natural, I don't know, like, who is Barack Obama? I don't want to be, like, you know, some McCain-era campaign ad. But he's a chameleon, and I think that's an advantage to him. Um, and I think that he has learned to talk the elite talk. You know, at some point, um, and uh, that's what happens when you spend a lot of time in these institutions, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I think he actively sought that out. Um, you know, right. I think, I think, Do you think it's a and, that, and that I think goes back very, very far. That goes back at least to Indonesia. Um, that right. sense of, you know, I, I want to be the one in the room where the serious conversations are happening, not the one on the outside yelling at those people. Right. Um, Do you think it's a problem for Kagan, the fact that she's from this? I mean, I think that it's an incredibly uninspired and sort of boring pick. I yeah. can't really get myself that excited about it. But I do think the one critique that I've heard that is useful is that she is utterly institutionalist um, in a way that probably is more complete than any other Supreme Court nominee in recent memory, um, despite the fact that everyone on the court went to Yale or Harvard Law right. School. Right. Yeah, I don't think she's any different from Roberts in that regard. I mean, he's a pretty, you know, utterly institutionalist type. Um, I mean, is that, is that sad that we now have this state of affairs where, like, there are no Protestants and there are no non-Ivy Leaguers? Yeah, I, I think it is sad. I, I, I focus less, I guess, on sort of the Ivy League side of it, and I think it's sort of a mild positive that she's not a judge, but it's it's very mild because she's such a, you know, in spite of not being a judge, she's still so incredibly um, establishmentarian. Um, yeah, I mean, I... I would not want a court composed entirely of eccentric iconoclasts, but I think it's useful to have, you know, a, a, a certain number of them on the court, and um, and she's obviously not that, and I don't expect Obama to ever appoint one. Um, I think that the and, and the and and I think it makes sense in general for the president to want a court that is predictable and boring. It doesn't make a lot of sense for the president to want a court that will be unpredictable and, and potentially challenge him. Um, but um, but well, I think it's short sighted yeah, I mean, in terms of the health of the of the, of, of the of the court and of democracy as a whole. What I, what I will say is though that um, you know Obama when he was challenged he was challenged a couple of times in his uh, I think he, it, back, going back to when he he taught at Chicago. Um, over kind of, you know, does he believe in sort of all these, you know, various liberal theories of, you know, some of the more radical, I should say, theories Critical of jurisprudence, um, yeah. you know. And his answer generally was, you know, he approves of the, the goals, but he doesn't think the judiciary is institutionally well set up to right. achieve them. Right. And um, I think that is completely and, fair and a good stance for him to have. Um, I don't think you're going to see the court in open conflict with the president about pretty much anything. Um, perhaps Citizens United, which Kagan argued is solic- solicitor general, mm-hmm. um, he's come out as sort of like being like, you know, um, visibly pissed about that, um, which I think um, is interesting from mm-hmm. his perspective as a lawyer and as a, and as a, as a, as a constitutional law scholar. Um, I guess my complaint about Kagan goes back to uh, an argument that you put forward um, in a post about the closing of the conservative mind. Yeah. And the sort of, you know, if I may recap <laughs> your, your sure. argument, it's essentially that, you know, if you want certain outcomes, you can sort of pay someone money at a think tank to sort of come up with the outcome. Or you could give someone who has 
the flexibility of mind and the openness of mind and the sort of um, faculty to sort of talk about an issue. Right. Time and space and money to then come up with some sort of outcome that you would imagine would be um, optimized. Right. Now, is the court similar to that? I mean, your critique really was that the conservative movement has ceased to do that, has ceased to, has, has been so outcomes oriented that it's not process oriented. The process of discovery and the process of intellectual advancement is less important to conservatives than it is to liberals. How do you think that overlays with the court? Um, I, I, may, I, may, I may take a pass on sort of drawing any kind of, you know, direct analogy between the two, because I think I was, I was talking about something specific there. But so mm-hmm. let's just talk about kind of um, whether I think the court has gotten, if I, if I can paraphrase that, you're asking sort of has the court gotten more outcome oriented and putting less. Putting you on here to like vote liberal um, versus we're yeah. putting you on here to like think. Um, and I think that the, right. I think Republicans, like they have with think tanks, have put people on the floor to vote certain ways, as opposed to what Obama apparently is doing, right. to the chagrin of many progressives, is putting someone on there to think. Um, well, I think in terms of people's perception of the court, I think um, I think Bush versus Gore was a real watershed, in that I think uh, on the left, um, you saw people say basically, wow, you know, this this decision makes no sense and more to the point makes no sense in terms of the professed ideology of the political movement right. that supposedly these people are, are, are supporting, whether or not they really are sort of members, uh, uh, you know, of that. And I think, um, there's been, uh, you know, I, I, I think the, the, the conservative side of the argument, the right wing side of the argument of sort of how to take the courts um, has gotten more open in, in more recent years about simply saying, you know, these are the right ways to read, you know, these parts of the Constitution, and that's what we want. We want people, you know, th- there's, not, there's not really a coherent judicial philosophy, I think, you know, from first principles that gets to sort of the checklist of everything that the conservative movement is supposed to believe in. Right. So if if you want judges who are going to strike down certain kinds of laws and uphold other, you know, kinds of laws, um, you know, you really are kind of presenting sort of a checklist. Um, I, I guess I don't think that I wouldn't go so far as to say that somebody like, you know, Roberts right. or Alito does that. I don't think anybody on the right. court does that. I don't think anybody sort of has just a checklist and sort of says, I'm supposed to read things this way, and I do that. Um, but um, but I think that you need people on the court. And the example I, I, I put on, on, on the blog was the, 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 the Hamdi decision, right, where you had the most strongly worded anti-government um, uh, dissent. So the, 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 the decision went against the government, but it was a relatively modest decision against the government, and then there was a single dissent Mm -hmm. for the government and two different dissents written, both more strongly against the government. And the most strong one that basically said, um, you know, if Congress wants to uh, suspend the writ of habeas corpus, that's what they have to do. And if they don't do that, then it applies, and it's really cut and dried. The two justices who signed that dissent were um, uh, Stevens, uh, leaving, and Scalia, right? And you want to have a, a court right. where there are enough justices like that who will say, no, you know what, this is the way I see, this is the way I understand the law to work, and I'm following that where it goes, whether or not my friends and allies, you know, agree with that place that I've wound up. You want enough of those that the court doesn't become um, a pure, you, you want the court to be to some extent a check on the political branches, you know, particularly I think in situations where kind of everybody knows from both right, sides no, I, what, yeah. you know, what the state wants, right? Those are the situations where you have to be most sensitive to saying, you know, the court being able to say, well, I think well, wait a second, the sort of, is I mean, that I think really that that's right. I think we can agree about that, but again, the sort of the, the disinterestedness of the Supreme Court justice because of a lifetime appointment um, facilitates that type of scholarship and that sort of wide-ranging, flexible thinking, as does the structure of the court, um, which is, um, you know, plural, of course. Um, but with respect to the sort of politics of putting someone on mm-hmm. the court, 
I think the reason why people are, to the extent that liberals are, sort of a little irked about the selection of Elena Kagan is that they feel that Republicans outside of the court um, do not ascribe to this sort of philosophy of, you know, um, thinking critically about the law. Um, and so there, if, when opportunities to appoint justices come up, the Republican Party nominates strong ideological conservatives, and when the opportunity to nominate Democratic, Democratic, uh, when a Democrat has an opportunity to nominate a justice and they pick someone who is thoughtful and middle of the road, at the end of the day, the Democrats lose. And I think that that is, a, is valid as a sort of critique of Obama's choice. Um, but I guess the fault for that doesn't really lie with him, right? It lies with the folks who are convinced with ide- uh, obsessed with ideological purity to the point where they would like, you know, sort of well, I, the I, right I, nearest thing would be the mm-hmm. obvious example where they're just like, we don't want to guess. We, we want a sure thing, which is like a right. little bit of the problem you were describing in your, in that post. So I just, it's, it's probably less about the court than about the politics. Well, I think, I think the Republicans, the dissenters in the Republican party who, who opposed and ultimately managed to get Harriet Mears withdrawn, I think they would have lost right. if she were a qualified nominee. You know, I think if, 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 if Bush had appointed Gonzalez, for example, who would also have been totally unreliable on things that, right. um, uh, the conservative movement considered really important. Uh, I think he would have been um, a successful okay. nominee because he was obviously so. You think they were finally being the uh, So, so I think that's she was. A, she was a little bit of a special case, um, but um, I think the question you have to ask, right? First of all, is there much of a political constituency for a sort of you know Marshall Brennan style, um, you know, forthright uh, progressive? Um, crusading court. And, and I'd argue there really isn't. You know, there may be a substantial constituency for that, um, um, in the legislature. You know, I'm, I'm willing to entertain that, that, that sort of mm-hmm. the progressive mm-hmm. moment that we saw in 2008 hasn't really ended, that this is like I a blip so. and, and we're going to come back, it's going to come back roaring in 2012. <laughs> but, but yeah, I don't right. think that's true at the judicial level. Well, maybe level. we should wrap up now. Um, hold on just one second. Um, we have been talking for some time. Oh, okay. Sorry, I just no, wanted I mean, to switch I think, phones um, the battery was dying on You know, well, confirmation hearings are going to be boring. They're not going to be as interesting as Sotomayor's. But, um, but at the very least, Elena Kagan will be held, to her, held yeah. to her prior writings, which is that people ought to say what they mean and what they plan to do and how they feel about things, um, which is... Well, her writings are interesting because she's very good in them, not... No, I know, and I think it's, it's she, wonderfully she ironic thinks. that the one... Well, one of maybe like a dozen things that we have to look at is something asking for full disclosure at confirmation hearing. So, right. you know, she'll do her thing. Right. Um, I'm a little disappointed that um, the president went so inside, I mean, literally his own brain for, <laughs> for a Supreme Court pick. Yeah. Um, but I'm sure that she will do a good job. And I'm Did you have that. someone you particularly wanted to see? Well, I was really I mean, swayed a, a when sort of... I read about Diane Wood, who is, uh, you know, obviously sort of on paper – um, a strong candidate, um, has been a justice on the Seventh Circuit mm-hmm. for a long time, is from Chicago, I think went to UT Austin, which would sort of scramble the dynamics again with respect to the pedigree of the, the justices. Um, but also, you know, is 10 years older than Kagan, and so perhaps that was a knock against her. Um, I'm not too convinced mm-hmm. that having a non-judge is that important, to be honest. People talked about Jennifer Granholm or some of the other politicians, and it's just, I don't know. Uh-huh. It'll be interesting to see who the next one is, because I feel like this is, like, if you wanted to do the progression, it was like, so Tamayor was like, you know, the like, I dare you to vote against her. Elena Kagan is a safe one. The third right. pick, which maybe will come before Obama's end of his first term, or perhaps his second one, will be where we sort of really see. Well, a lot will depend on who retires. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it might be Ginsburg. Yeah, I mean, if so, it, who knows? Um, I mean, if if, if uh, you know, I, I think one thing that I've heard from a lot of progressives is that their their big disappointment is this feels like the right nominee for the second term, or this feels like the right nominee if there were a conservative or or centrist retirement, but because it's, you know, uh, you know, because it's, um, uh, Stevens retiring that, uh, you know, it's a real shame he didn't, you know, appoint somebody who was, um, you know, more clearly on, 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 on the left or more, or more forceful, you know, um, someone who could be a counter to Scalia. Um, or something like yeah, that. We'll um, so it will be interesting to see what happens if Kennedy retires as opposed to if um, Ginsburg, uh, uh, Ginsburg retires. Right. 
Um, well, it's been a pleasure talking with you. I thought that was really a helpful, a helpful a little, little argument we had about immigration. I'm going to think some more about it. Thanks. We never got to Greenberg, oh, that's though. That's true. I haven't seen we Greenberg. we got to do this again. We have to do it again. Um, uh, but I do encourage everyone to read uh, Tony A.O. Scott's article um, a couple weeks ago about, uh, what is it, the discontent of the sort of, like, post-boomer slacker dude. Um, yeah. Who's about 40 now and, you know, whereas once, what was the movie he was talking about? He was writing about me. <laughs> well, he wasn't writing about me. Um, but we should come back to that. This was super fun. Um, I thoroughly hope um, that everyone enjoys this immensely long blogging heads. And we'll <laughs> both see you next time. Great. Thanks Thank a lot. You. Yep. Bye. Bye.